Ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, let me welcome all of you here again. Uh, you have noticed that we are expanding with our uh, Greater Middle East program, so uh, beyond our traditional uh, lectures which uh, we are organizing with uh, um, Tomáš Poyar and uh, the Israeli Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have uh, uh, welcomed recently also uh, the Kurdish uh, speakers here to uh, uh, enlighten us about, uh, about the development and I'm very glad now that uh, today uh, we have another uh, lecture within that broader series. This time it's uh, organized in the cooperation with uh, uh, the ECR, so European Alliance of uh, Conservatives and Reformers. Uh, I want specially thanks to Jan Zahradil, our uh, member of the Parliament, the European Parliament, and uh, one of the leaders of uh, uh, this particular fraction. Uh, the guest uh, who will be uh, specially introduced by uh, Jan Zahradin. Zahradil comes from Iran, not from Tehran. He is living in, uh, in exile and representing one of uh, uh, the well-established uh, opposition organization of uh, the Iranian uh, people in abroad. And I think it uh, comes at the right time because uh, we all are watching carefully uh, the current uh, Geneva talks. Uh, we were informed that there was some breakthrough, but uh, that it's not done uh, yet. Uh, but certainly it's somehow changing uh, uh, the general atmosphere in, uh, in the West, so both in the US and in, in, in Europe. I noticed that there are many business delegations and uh, political delegations who are already in the starting blocks to, to, to run there. So I guess that uh, this is the right time also uh, to listen uh, to those who, as uh, I expect, have uh, a much more uh, critical uh, attitude towards uh, the current Iranian regime than we can uh, listen in uh, actual uh, media mainstream. So. Once again, welcome. I am glad that the house uh, is uh, full again, as it is already the tradition. And now I invite uh, to the floor uh, Jan Zahradil to introduce our guest of honor. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's true that. Uh, Iran, once again, is in the forefront of world media and politics and diplomacy. There's a couple of reasons for that. Of course, there, uh, there is, uh, first of all, this recent treaty, uh, which already has been criticized by, by some for making allegedly too many concessions to Iranian nuclear program. Uh, then, of course, we have witnessed also some kind of rapprochement between Iran and Russia which resulted into agreement on military cooperation uh, and also even delivery of some warfare uh, from Russia to Iran. And uh, last but not least, uh, also to a declaration uh, of uh, Iranian defense minister made very recently who invited Russia and others to form uh, a kind of alliance against NATO expansion, which clearly defines also Iran as one of uh, strategic or geostrategic challengers of, of the West. Uh, we have also uh, witnessed spreading influence of Iran over the region with clear attempt to become a regional hegemon. We've seen this in Iraq, in Lebanon, most recently in Yemen. And all that together, uh, all those elements together, uh, pose certain risk or threat because we must not forget that we still have to do, uh, have to deal with a religious fundamentalist regime. An interesting thing is that long time before Arab Spring happened, uh, Iran was in fact a case of a very similar scenario where 
first we had uprising against secular dictator, then the secular dictator was ousted, but then this, uh, let's say, in nature, democratic revolution was taken over very soon by Islamists uh, imposing very strict rules on the whole society. So we should study carefully the situation in Iran uh, also beside other things also because to some extent we can see it as a predecessor of many situations we can see now in, in Libya and in Syria and, and elsewhere. Uh, we have today a very outstanding speaker. Uh, he's an ex-diplomat uh, uh, living today in Norway. Uh, he's, he's, by the way, a completely secular person. He calls himself a humanist, so he has nothing to do with any religion at all. Uh, he took personal engagement in that revolution from 1979, and uh, he's been a witness of everything that happened. And uh, uh, last but not least, he is also no new guest in Prague, because he already has been several times a guest of an uh, international conference called Forum 2000, which some of you might know very well. Uh, he represents an exile uh, organization, an exile opposition organization, called uh, National Council of Resistance of Iran. Uh, uh, it's a, a very uh, common thing and very frequent thing that this organization is being described uh, by Tehran regime as a terrorist organization uh, and uh, uh, I don't think that uh, they miss the opportunity even now. The truth is that one part of that organization called PMOI uh, has been on a blacklist in the European Union and uh, US a long time ago, but it's been delisted already. Uh, by coincidence, from the EU blacklist, it's been delisted during our uh, or the Czech EU presidency, where Mr. Vondra was minister responsible for European affairs. But of course, we know that uh, uh, undemocratic uh, regimes tend to describe all their democratic opponents usually as, uh, as terrorists. And uh, I think that we all uh, we uh, have our own experience with that from the times of former Czechoslovakia. So it's my great pleasure uh, to invite here uh, Mr. Pevis Kazai, who will be our keynote speaker for tonight or for this afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr. Kazai. The floor is yours. At the outset, I'm utterly thankful to you uh, uh, for your invitation, Mr. Bondra, and uh, for your nice words, uh, uh, Mr. Zaroy. And uh, I greet you all and, and say to you all, to uh, as you say it in your language. And, uh, and I'm very happy and utterly delighted to be among you today. <clears throat> I love your country. I love the history of your country which inspired me when I was a law student in Tehran University, the spring of your country, of Prague. And, uh, and also I have been uh, coming to this uh, beautiful city, which I think is the most beautiful city in Europe. Uh, let Paris uh, be a little sad about it. Uh, and I am very uh, delighted to also come to this forum 2000 every, almost every year, uh, and to participate in the fruitful discussions about the current situations of the world, especially democratizations. So, um, as uh, Mr. Zara kindly uh, mentioned, <clears throat> it's not a very uh, easy job when there is a country like Iran, strategically important, has oil, trade, military might, and then uh, situated in a very strategic uh, juncture between uh, Soviet Union, now Russia, and uh, those republics, and also the Gulf states, Middle East, Iraq, and then be in opposition. As uh, he mentioned, in 1979, we had a real democratic uprising in that country. And prior to that also in uh, 
1904. That was the first democratic uh, revolution in Iran. We called it constitutional revolution in 1904. That has paved the way, paved the way for other uprisings in the Ottoman Empire, in the Middle East, and especially in Egypt. That revolution was crushed. The second was the Mossadegh Revolution in 1953. He was a leader, like your great leader, also uh, who was also the figurehead of your country. I think his name also is very close to Mossadegh, Masrat, something like this. Yeah. Uh, and that was also crushed by a coup d'etat in 1953 by CIA and the MI6 because simply uh, we were unfortunate to be the <laughs> neighbor of the Soviet Union. At that time, in the middle of the Cold War, as you know it very well, every democratic inspiration and movements and revolutions they were suffocated by the Western intelligence at that time, being it the United States and the United Kingdom, simply they thought that that will lead to communism, that will lead to uprising uh, of the uh, uh, extreme leftists in those countries. This has happened in, in many countries, in Latin America, in Indonesia, uh, with Suhatro, and uh, toppling uh, Sukarno, and, uh, and just name it, you know, in many other, other countries, uh, Chile and other places. Uh, that was dormant, this uh, inspiration of the Iranian people for democracy, being under the dictatorship of the kings and emperors for almost 3,000 years. In 1979, it was as he mentioned it very correctly. It was a democratic movement which was also very popular. I was a young diplomat, myself, career diplomat. We took part in that, everybody, Christians, Muslims, non-Muslims, Zoroastrians, Jewish people, all the minorities and majorities in Iran. And Due to the lack of the political institutions, which is, uh, which is lamentable in those countries, this is the same thing is happening to the Arab Spring. The dictators, the so-called secular dictators, they crashed, they demolished all the political institutions, and when the king or the emperor or the per lifetime president is uh, kicked out from the country, there is a vacuum. There is a lacuna and that is filled up immediately by people who have traditional organizations, being it clergy people. Before in the, uh, in the, world, in the Cold War period, so there was a movement, there was an ideology, aggressive ideology, uh, Marxist-Leninism and all these things, they, they could uh, hijack somehow. That's why the fear of the West in uh, accepting democratic process in those countries under that period was somehow understandable. But right now, there is one ideology which is very aggressive. This is, day before yesterday we had Nazism, yesterday we had Stalinism, and now we have Islamism. That is attractive, that uh, recruits people, and they have organization, as you saw it in Egypt, and you saw it in other countries in this so-called Arabic Spring, except, luckily, except Tunisia. I have been to Tunisia because I'm also a member of a group in the parliament of Norway. I'm a Norwegian citizen also, and I'm very politically active in there. And we have been invited, a group of that uh, forum in the parliament, we have been invited from Norway to Tunisia. And I can tell you that, let's cross the finger, this nation is doing very well. Because simply, the institutions, they survived. Women organizations, uh, trade unions, 
jurists and lawyer organizations, and also and also the industrial organizations. I mean, industrial people, people who were uh, uh, concerned chiefs, you know, chiefs in the country. So uh, Tunisia survived, and let's really wish them all the best. But our revolution was such that we say in English to uh, jumping from the, from the uh, frying pan into the fire. So we wanted to uh, finally, after almost 100 years of fighting, we wanted to make a democracy, but it didn't work and we got the worst out of it. That is what has happened to my country. And I was a diplomat in uh, career diplomat. I worked in France. I studied in France international law and worked with the French also Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a stagiaire, as a diplomat, and also in the United Nations. Uh, at the age of 25, this revolution came and I was a diplomat. I joined it and I staged demonstrations of the diplomats. I gathered them. That's why the BBC called us the rebel diplomats. And that was very true. So, but due to the, my activities in the revolution, I got a higher position. At the age of 30, I became ambassador of Sweden and then Norway. But I got very, very rapidly disillusioned when Khomeini started taking the American embassy people as a hostage. And then he sat in that holy city in Com and he promised in Paris that he will never uh, mix his career with uh, politics, but gradually, slowly, slowly he came and he said that uh, that was the democracy is not a very good thing, this is uh, Western. And then we have seen that he, he wrote a book and nobody saw that book when he was in exile. And the name of the book was Islamic States. You can just read it like Mein Kampf of Adolf Hitler. And in that Mein Kampf, which is called Islamic State, then we found out what a, what a monster has been the leader of that revolution. So I joined the uh, National Council of Resistance of Iran when it was established in 1980 in exile. And I worked for them as a mole underground while I was in the embassy. I helped many people who were in the dead list of the regime, I gave them the false passport, like Wallenberg has done under the Second World War in, uh, in Hungary, that Swedish diplomat. I also did my best in order to help and save some people. And then at one moment, when the regime started smelling about my activities, I made a press conference and I joined openly this National Council of Resistance. That is the short story about my country and where we are today. Umbrella organization and CRI, we have Christians, we have Jewish people, Iranian, Zaratustran people, and humanists like me, and from different walks of uh, society, we have member in this uh, 600 member parliament in Paris, and 52% uh, of the members are women, and the whole leadership is women, we are doing exactly opposite of what the Islamists are doing, what this, uh, these uh, fundamentalists are thinking about women. And then uh, we have a leader, Mrs. Maryam Rajavi, who is a Muslim. He is a Muslim woman, but he is, she is at the forefront of uh, this big war against Islamic fundamentalism. We thought about the threats in the current world. And I try to figure out what are really the threats that we are facing uh, in this juncture of the history of mankind. Uh, I remember that Mr. Kufi Annan some years ago, he also gave an appointment to a group of people uh, in order to find out what are the threats that really uh, very, very much uh, uh, against the humanity, uh, democratic values, and human values uh, at the global uh, level. And they mentioned some, and I added also some later, that threats I can just 
mentioned to you, uh, grosso modo, environmental catastrophe, everybody knows, pandemics and uh, epidemics. It could be poverty and gap between rich and poor from the other world, from the third world, from the poor world, and hence all these refugee catastrophes you are witnessing today. It could be an atomic and MDW threat, weapon of mass destructions, and atomic ventures. It could be regional wars, which could easily sp spread regional and sometimes international, which we see slowly, slowly in Yemen today. We see terrorism, and we see a new aggressive and human and anti-human, really. The biggest enemy of mankind in the modern history is this so-called jihad and Islamism which of course has nothing to do really with the religion. I'm not a religious man. Uh, I don't believe in any religion, but I respect them all. That was not really the meaning of this, those prophets like Jesus, like Buddha, like uh, Moses, and like Muhammad. That one day some people in their name, that's the thing, despicable thing that you could never imagine in your, in your slightest dream that one day that could happen in front of you in the, uh, uh, in the TV that you witnessed. And then we have this uh, expansionism of dictators. I mean, the dictators, they have the tendency to make alliance, to expand. And that is also one is what is happening now in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, and in Lebanon. So, if you look at this list, one could find more threats. I could easily tell you that six of them, in six of these threats, the Iran regime is the almost main actor. Paramount importance of the regime's presence in at least six of them. The others, like environmental catastrophe, they could be also a, 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 a like what you call it, the effect of, of, uh, uh, of, of these uh, atrocities. Uh, refugee problem and all these things also come as a, as a consequence of these uh, global threats. Having said that very quickly and grosso modo, then my question is what to do to confront this. You know very well, or you have, must have read a lot about it, that before the Iranian Revolution in 1979, we have never had an Islamic terrorism. We have never had it. We had terrorism in the West and in the East, but that was uh, Red Army, Bader Meinhof, and all this... Uh, so-called ML uh, uh, guerrilla people who wanted to change the world by guns and by killings, uh, but never Islamic, never Islamic terror action. There was one in Palestine, two, three, but that was on a national basis. That was not in the name of Islam when they have made this uh, hijacking of their the airplanes or something. Uh, that was something uh, based on the national movement. But it was after Khomeini and establishing an ideology and making a state of that. Because to have an ideology, aggressive ideology is one thing, like Daesh and ISIS and others, but to make government, a state based on that, and to use all the possibilities and wealth of that country and that state in favor of that uh, destructive ideology is something else. That's why after the establishment of this so-called Islamic revolution, everything is started by uh, terror actions, 
The first was American hostage taking in, in Tehran, and then it was these explosions of the military bases of the United States in, uh, in Lebanon, where 280 soldiers were massacred. And then it went on like a, like a sort of a, a chain action and reaction in the world. Here I'm not going to say that this is a Shia and that is a Sunni. I think they are on the same line because, as you know, we have today more than one billion Muslims in the world. One million, maybe two, three hundred millions. But 18% of them only, they are Shias and the rest of Sunnis. And the majority, the majority, 99.9.9.9, they are ordinary people, nice people, living in India, in Pakistan, in, in America, in Europe. But there is an ideology, destructive interpretation of Islam, which has made one of the biggest hurdle and biggest threat to our civilization today. And I emphasize that has nothing to do with the religion. Uh, the good reason is that in the NCRI, in this para, uh, parapoly organization, umbrella organization, we have a Muslim organization, PMI, but they interpret Islam 100% different. They give power to women. They are feminist Muslims. They are democratic Muslims, secular Muslims. In the same time, that group is also respecting its own uh, tradition, and we respect that. So, that means that this destructive ideology, this monster, can be contained, can be defeated. How? I don't have a recipe to just say, I give to you, but uh, as I have gathered some experiences in my career, both as a diplomat before the revolution and now, I know that the first war should be waged, waged by Muslims themselves. I always say to the Muslims uh, who invite me in Norway to the park, I said, you must clean up this mess yourself because in the name of your religion all these atrocities are committed. If you just keep quiet, the main Muslims are quiet, then, then never, you can never, you can never uh, clean this bad image that this regime and ISIS gave to Islam and your religion. And I give them the example. For example, when Salman Rushdie, you remember very well, uh, a writer, an Indian English writer, wrote a book, satire book, making fun of religion and also Islam. The fatwa of Khomeini came against him and he was having a bounty on his head for several millions. Still it is in a bank in Iran and sometimes they say it is increasing. And then uh, some of his translators they were killed or stabbed or injured. At that time, we, National Council of Resistance of Iran, at the forefront of it, the PMOI, the Muslim organization, which is the backbone of this, we made demonstrations, we made press conferences, we took some of the progressive clergy people who are in our resistance to all the parliaments in, the, in Europe, wrote articles, shouting and screaming, saying this has nothing to do with my religion, those religious people said. And, but many European Muslims, they were so wishy-washy, they were saying, well, he should not be killed, but we understand, you know, we understand that, you know, the Muslims are hurt. Who is the representative of the Muslims to come and say that all of them are hurt by this book? Who is the spoke, <laughs> speaker of that great, great, great religion? So, and unfortunately, some of the parliamentarians even, the Muslim parliamentarians in Scandinavia, in my country, Norway, 
they were also very uh, mumbling. They're saying, "Well, well, uh, well, I, I take little distance, but uh, but we said no. We have to really demonstrate. So we made demonstrations. Uh, I established a committee in Norway, and then we said that is how you have to defend the dignity of your religion. You cannot simply say that, okay." Poor, he should not be killed, but I understand the Muslims are, are angry. Muslims, Khomeini was angry only. Nobody else was angry. After him, some people, they got angry. Some very few people. So, ideological uh, war against this aggressive uh, ideology is of paramount importance. And that has to be waged by the Muslims themselves, I think. And and then at the national level, Iranian people are very much organized. They undo the things that the regime says to them. The constitution of the regime is full of, full of fascism about the, how a person should uh, behave, even your private life, even the way you dress, even in the inner family life of yours is absolutely under the scrutiny of just just George Oliver said in that book, 1984, by Big Brother, Khomeini and, and the leaders. But the Iranian people, they don't listen. You see that the Iranian women in Tehran, although they get lashes, 74, by showing their hair, they come out and they again show their hair. They get lashes. They have, they have, really, uh, they have really worn out the regime. The regime is tired. That's why if you see some liberal woman in the street, it's not that the regime is becoming more liberal, it's that the, the women are really at the forefront of this, this, uh, this uh, passive, uh, if I can call it passive, this active really resistance, social resistance. And then organization, and then we have made a, a national liberation army uh, in between Iraq and Iran. You know that uh, there was eight years war, and Khomeini had a dream after the fall of Soviet Union, and before that also he had a dream to make an Islamic Union, Islamic Republic Union in the world. And his first target in his Mein Kampf, in his book, Islamic State, is Iraq, because 60% of the civilization, of the population of Iraqis, they are Shias, and the same religion as Khomeini. Our army was there and we defeated. We didn't let him to continue the war again and again and at the cost of the millions of Iranian youth who were taken from the school and sent without any military training to the minefields. And one million Iranian Iraqis were killed as a result of that. While Saddam Hussein, after two years, he withdrew his uh, troops, uh, troops from Iran and everybody in the world, they were ready for a ceasefire, and we signed the ceasefire with the Iraqi government, we declared the war illegitimate. So this organization is there. Iranian people are very much really poised to, to really to do away with this reign of terror, medieval terror. But internationally, this is my last point I wanted to raise, then I'll be open for discussion. But internationally, there have been a lack of uh, really uh, muscled uh, activities due to the appeasement policies. As you know, this beautiful Europe, especially this beautiful country, has uh, big scars in the history because of that appeasement, because of Mr. Chamberland, who went and signed a contract with Hitler, and he came back, he said, no, peace for all, forever. And then, you know, the next day, what had happened to the world, to Europe? to this beautiful Europe. So uh, this appeasement policy, unfortunately, is still, is still active. And the international organ uh, community does not really take this very serious because they think that now this ISIS is there in Iraq so that they can cooperate with the Iranian regime. Because there are two types of ISIS. One is a Shia ISIS, they call it a uh, uh, Faki, the, according to Iranian uh, uh, constitution, he is the representative of the God on the earth till he comes the Messiah of the Shia 
and bring justice to the world. You can imagine how, how can you extract democracy from this, uh, from this uh, constitution. But in Sunni Islam, ISIS and East and Daesh, they call it Khalifat. But they are the same brand. And I think Khomeini regime and Khomeini ideology is the founder of this Islamic Jihad, as I have mentioned to you. So international solidarity is very important. Pressuring, pressurizing regime is very important. Not to give up. The regime is playing very well. We have broken the Khomeini's uh, army who wanted to take Iraq and go and take uh, uh, Jordan and, and so on and so forth and make a Islamic state there. And we have also in the resistance, we have the first time in 2002, we have revealed the atomic size of the regime. It was Iranian resistance who did it, PMOI. And that came as a big shock in the world. Even George Bush said that the Iranian opposition opened our eye. But now with this wishy-washy politics, uh, they want to have a win-win with this regime, which has been hitting this uh, dreadful, heinous plan. Imagine an atomic bomb in the hand of a, a jihadist. You know, you know these days one can make uh, atomic bomb at the size of a Coca-Cola uh, 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 thing, you know, uh, bottle. It's not like this uh, fat boy and this in, the, in Hiroshima and, uh, and, and Nakazaki. So this we have revealed, but the world has to put that most pressure on the regime and don't let them to, to really make the atomic bomb. And also we must make a coalition the democratic people in the world, regardless of the frontier, regardless of the nationalities, we who defend our values, democratic values, human values, common heritage from French Revolution, before that also Magna Carta in, in England, and all these beautiful movements, your beautiful country, the movements, the people who gave of the la the, their lives under the, the, the chains of the Soviet Union in this beautiful Prague. This is a human heritage. We have to make a co coalition and go and defend ourselves because they are united. You see that as he mentioned, Mr. Zaradi, uh, Zaradi that you know, no, they, want, they want to make a coalition like a Warsaw Pact, this time between the Muslims, uh, fundamentalists, and uh, Mr. Putin. So, they are organized, we have to also organize. And then the last two uh, words, uh, one is that uh, I was uh, in, a, I am the member of the uh, National Defense Association of Norway. Uh, I was yesterday in a, in a, in a big meeting, uh, the defense minister was talking and also the security uh, people. Be careful about the students who come from Iran and they want to study physics. Norwegian government now gathered 60 of them and kicked them out uh, three, three, four weeks ago. They come as a student exchange to your country and they say they are not uh, from the regime, but they are paid by the regime because nobody can get uh, permission to, to, to leave Iran. The refugees, they just run away from, from Iran. And they go to the universities that study this sensitive pensums and, uh, uh, and things, and then they take it back. And the Norwegian and Swedish uh, uh, authorities and Danish, and now Finland is doing it, they are uh, starting to kick them out. And the regime is angry, and then want to say, why you are angry if you are not behind them, you know? So, uh, and then this is a big, big, big issue now that I, uh, I hope that your beloved country uh, uh, Czech Republic will take notice of that. I I'm sure there is a cooperation between your security and my country's security in Norway. And the last, and the last is that for, for showing, in order to show this international solidarity of us, we people who believe in democracy and human rights and women's rights versus those uh, heinous 
organizations and jihadists and anti-democratic forces. Every year we have a big gathering in Paris, and this gathering is sometimes 100,000 people comes from parliaments, from American Congress, from Czech Republic. Mr. Zaradi is one of the really staunch uh, supporters of this democratic movement. And then they show to the world that we are also united. Last year we had four or five, I think, uh, President Iran, U.S. president candidates who participated. Rudy Giuliani, Gingrich, uh, McCain, and then it was a big gathering from the whole Europe, from Middle East, from Palestine, from Azerbaijan, from the whole world, India, Pakistan. So I invite you. I will uh, give you the card and I invite you. First of all, I wanted to invite you uh, 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 because he is himself one of the, uh, the, the main, the main uh, hosts always. Uh, to, uh, if you have opportunity to come to this big gathering in Paris. Thank you very much. I hope that I didn't take too much time, and I am, and we are at your disposal for any further discussion or exchange of views. Thank you. So, uh, yes, it works. We do have about 40 minutes for discussion, so our guest is uh, uh, ready, of course, to respond to any of your question uh, dealing with uh, Iran, with uh, the greater Middle East in general, uh, with the religions, maybe even with Norway. <laughs> uh, so just prepare uh, your question. Maybe I will start. Uh, you have mentioned also Arab Spring. I remember when it has broke out a couple of years ago, there was a debate uh, among uh, the Czechs. Uh, and to sum up the debate, the optimists, they were arguing, yes, it's something like 1989. Uh, the realists, they were saying, no, it's, look, it's rather like 1848 in Europe. And then, uh, when the time has passed, uh, uh, the pessimists also uh, entered the uh, debate, comparing this to uh, 1618 and forecasting uh, uh, something like a 30 years war of the religion. Uh, what is your view, if you uh, would uh, make some parable where you should uh, opt for, among the pessimist, among the optimist, or uh, somehow in between? Or do you see any other uh, historical parallel to the history of Europe? Thank you. Uh, well, I am, by nature, I'm very optimist. I think the trends of the humanity goes towards more democracy, more getting rid of those uh, horrible ideologies and fascism, Nazism, and, and uh, Stalinism, and all those isms. But this one also, this green one, uh, and, and, and rightfully it is called the green, the Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, color, this is also is doomed to failure, I think, but it takes time. Uh, the reason, as I mentioned, at these revolutions, they have been uh, defeated, they have not been fruitful, they have not reached the goals, as I mentioned, was the lack of political institutions. You should not compare it with your great country. You have a very long history in your country, both cultural and also institutions and, and also education. I mean, in those countries, uh, there are many factors that makes a revolution uh, derailed and, uh, and defeated. One of them is, I blame always the dictators before. I blame always the Shah of Iran, the king of Iran. He called himself the king of kings. 
He was very modern when he came to Europe with his uh, queen. It was just like a dream of every people in the world. Still, this old woman, they say, oh, Faradiba, oh, the king, the Persian king. But they didn't, he didn't learn that this Europe, he imitates. This Europe has given the highest price in the history for democracy. And this democracy has to be, ha has to be taken from Europe, not only uh, Sarvaganza, Maxim restaurants, and uh, he made a big uh, celebration of the 2,500 years of Cyrus Empire in Iran, and he uh, positioned himself as a, as a son of Cyrus the Great, uh, bringing uh, the cooks from France and spending millions, billions even, uh, money instead of thinking about the people. So unfortunately, this, uh, this type of uh, uh, lacuna, vacuum, uh, is the main problem. And the lack of uh, political institutions also historically, and also uh, that, you know, the religious people, they are snatching the revolutions. They hijack them. And ironically enough, I was a diplomat under the Shah. As I was 22 years old when I became a diplomat. I saw that the king of Iran, in order to prove that his power is coming from the God, he needed the mullahs. He needed these clergy people. He paid them. They were very rich. They had the madrasa. They had the, the institutions. But if myself, as a student of law of Tehran, we wanted to make a little organization, we he used to be sent to, to the prison. I was myself two, three times arrested because they said, why did you make this uh, organization movement in the university? So the kings, they needed the, the clergy. And then when the king is gone, the clergy came and took over and galvanized the whole revolution. This is one very sad factor I could mention. There must be some many other factors. Merci. And please, uh, let's introduce yourself. If. Uh, I'm Mohammed Saad uh, from Egypt. Uh, Mohammed. Mohammed Saad, yeah, from Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's start from uh, uh, the, the last phrase that you said. They need the clergy people. They need them. I mean, it's a kind of a circle. Uh, the totalitarianism leads to theological states, and the theological state may lead to totalitarianism. So, I believe that to uh, break this circle, we need to uh, reach the historical compromise. I believe I agree with you with 90% from what you mentioned, but I believe uh, the only difference in Tunisia was this historical compromise. The conservatives, I mean the, uh, the Islamists in Tunis Tunisia were more advanced than the Islamists in uh, Egypt, and the secular people in uh, Tunisia were more advanced. That's why they uh, reached this, let's say, compromise. Without this compromise, we will not reach democracy in uh, Islamic uh, world. We need to contain uh, uh, the Islamists, uh, uh, let's say the moderate Islamists, and by this way we will exclude uh, the uh, fanatics. One question about uh, how, do you see, how do you see the uh, religious conflict between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and it could uh, somehow it could develop this kind of uh, uh, regional conflict in a secular way or to find kind of compromise. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think I, uh, you mentioned it uh, very correctly, Mohammed, that uh, uh, it should be a compromise. That's why uh, Mujahideen Khal of Iran, PMI, the backbone of the Iran resistance, they really wanted to have a compromise with the Khomeini. They went out and met him. They say that we are also Shia Muslims. We are like you, but we want to cooperate with you. Then he said, I believe that you only believe in democracy. Democracy doesn't exist in Islam. 
And then he, uh, they, that meeting only uh, was for 10, 15, uh, I mean, half an hour. Khomeini just told him, I think you're not a Muslim because you want to have a westernized democracy. So you're right. We have to, that's why in the resistance also we are gathering all the progressive Muslims. I mean, the compromise is of paramount importance, as you said, Mohammed. For your second question about the conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, well, the, the, the main uh, backbone of it is these regional superpowers, because there are two superpowers. And, uh, and Saudi Arabia had a very good relationship with the uh, previous regime in Iran. And uh, they were cooperating. And also in the beginning of the revolution, there was a very good cooperation because we had a short-lived democracy for six months under the Bazargan prime minister, very, very compromisable and moderate Muslim. But uh, he kicked him out, uh, Khomeini. And then they started this uh, Khomeini's idea of uh, expanding because uh, these ideologies, they are expansionist. So he says that we have to make Islamic Republic in the world. In the constitution of the Iranian regime, is they don't say nation of Iran. They say there is no nation. There is an ummah. That means the whole Muslims in the world, they are one nation. And that has to be ruled by Khomeini. It is in the constitution, Article 4. So, and then they started really attacking Saudi Arabia and saying that they are usurpants. They are the people who are rich, pro-Americans. They are not revolutionaries. And they have to leave the Mecca and the holy places of Islam. And then the stage, I remember very well, Muhammad. They staged in, uh, I think, in, in 1981, the Hajjis, you know, the people who go to pilgrimage to, 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 to that. About two, three hundred military men in civil these revolutionaries, like, like, like henchmen, like SS of the, SS soldiers of Khomeini, they staged a demonstration in Mecca, bloody demonstration against the king of Saudi Arabia, saying that he is a usurpant, he is a American uh, uh, lucky, American marionette, uh, and we have to topple. That has triggered this rivalry between these uh, religious, because Shia, Iran with Saudi Arabia. But no, it is a war of influence that Saudi Arabia is an ally of the Western countries. The Iranian regime is getting closer and closer to this old Soviet Union style uh, 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 region, regional powers there. Uh, and then uh, try to uh, play with uh, Russia against the West. But Saudi Arabia has a stake in, especially in Yemen, because Yemen is so close to, to Saudi, to Saudi Ar uh, Arabia. Yemen is not, is not a joke. Yemen is the most difficult uh, situation. Because if you see here the, 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 the Iranian map, see, you could see that, uh, you could see that the, uh, if I could find it here, uh, that, that, that Yemen is, uh, is not, yeah, here it is, yes. You know, in, in, this is Iran, and then you see that Iraq is adjacent to, to Iran, and then Syria is close to Iraq. Therefore, also Iran has influence through the Iraqi government, which, is a, which was a, a Shia government, purely Shia government, unfortunately. That made all this problem, and Daesh and ISIS, they were born in this uh, turmoil and this mess that this uh, previous Iraqi uh, uh, minister made. But with, uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, uh, to Iran, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to Adan and to, uh, to Yemen, that is something else, because it's here. It is, it's one of the most strategic places, Babel Mandat, and that goes to the Sea, uh, Suez Canal. And here we have the, the oil coming from the, the, the Strait of Hormuz, and there are here the high sea. So here, Saudi Arabia cannot digest that, because 30% of the Iraqis, uh, of Yemenis, they are from Houthi religious uh, branch, which is an offspring of Shiism. Because Iranian Shias, they believe in 12 uh, Imam after the, the Ali, the founder. Uh, but here, who says they believe, I think, in, in, in five, 
and then uh, the Alawis of uh, of uh, Bashar Assad, also they are op offspring of Shias, they believe in seven. Ismailis, they believe in eight, something like this. But they are all Shias. So it is not, he, Saudi Arabia cannot swallow that. That Iran regime has already taken the most of Iraq, has already is present, present actively, militarily in Syria, in Lebanon, they have made this Hezbollah which is a branch of Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and Saudi Arabia cannot digest that. And that's why this conflict is going to be severe. Uh, very fortunately, the Security Council gave a resolution, and I was very scared that Mr. Putin will veto it. But uh, considering his relation also, Mr. Putin with the Arab world, uh, they have abstained, and this re resolution is uh, gone through, and. And, and valid, and that's why they are asking the United Nations Security Council and the whole world that who sees they should give up this coup d'etat they made against the, the government of the majority Sunnis. Yeah, Irena. Thank you very much. My name is Irena. I'm here from Prague. I have two questions. Uh, first question. Uh, if you were an advisor to President Obama, what would you suggest to him in this stage? Negotiate, stop the negotiation concerning the nuclear program. And the second question, if the agreement is signed in June, how do you think the conservatives in Iran would react? Thank you. Very good question. <laughs> well, if I was the advisor of Mr. Obama, uh, I would advise him not to give up with Syria. If you remember when Syria was using the chemical weapons against its people, that was a very good opportunity for the world to at least to at least close the 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 the, the, the area the the sky of the country and make a sort of a restriction or ban of the military flights of Bashar Assad. So they were close to that. But he gave up. I don't know what, why. And that has emboldened Mr. Assad to kill many thousands more, and still he is killing and massacring the people. So I think this, uh, this uh, instability of uh, Mr. Obama, uh, I'm not for Bush. I'm not for that, uh, that uh, cowboy who really changed the geopolitical situation of the Middle East uh, and made all this mess. But uh, when it comes to Obama, it is the other side of the bundle, I think. It's wishy-washy, it's very uh, unstable. And then uh, he wants to go clean after two years uh, and say that, okay, I did my best and I got the Nobel Prize also, and then that's it. I think uh, his wishy-washy politic, internally I agree that uh, Democrats are doing quite well when it comes to American society. But... Uh, um, myself, I'm a centrist, you know, politically. But I think what is happening now in uh, in, in, in in Obama administration is this lack of, uh, 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 yeah, sustainable uh, policy. Suddenly they give up. Suddenly they change. When it comes to this atomic uh, venture of the regime, okay, they can negotiate. But we have six resolutions of the United Nations, severe resolutions, putting the most severe. Uh, uh, sanctions against the regime. And the Iranian people are the ones who are really suffering because the mullahs are multi, multi millionaires. Their, their children, they show sometimes, they, they buy Porsches, they buy the best cars in the world, they have the best mansions in Paris and everywhere. So the corruption is to the bone of this regime. So the Iranian people are suffering. I think this, this, uh, revealing of our resistance uh, of these atomic sites has, has borne fruit. If we have not done that, the regime definitely would have had some atomic bomb, bomb like uh, North Korea today. But when it comes to these, uh, the latest negotiations, uh, it, is a, it is a very vague uh, promise. It has not yet gone into the practicalities. As you say in English, uh, the devil is in the detail always. You know, uh, they have to do a lot of things, and the regime cannot swallow, I think, that. Because uh, Khamenei tries, the supreme leader, to say that, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with that, go ahead, 
but he doesn't really back up uh, openly this because he he is he knows that if they sign then they have to sign the the uh, the protocol the protocol means that the they can go and check EIA can go and check everywhere in Iran they have to control and then they have to shut down the uh, the the uranium in reaching to 3.5 the Iranian regime has gone already to 20% and then they have to uh, to 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 close the uh, the heavy water plants in Iraq, in city of Iraq, and then they have to curtail so many thousands of the third generation of the search refuge. When it comes to the protocolic of that, I I I don't know if 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 Khomeini accept all these things. I think it is the same thing like Khomeini accepted the ceasefire with Iraq and called it the poison of ceasefire. So he has to drink like his predecessor Khomeini, the first Khalifa, a big, a big bowl of, uh, of uh, poison. Let's see. But I'm not really very optimistic about this, this, this deal, uh, given the fact that also the Congress is mobilizing against Obama. And Obama doesn't have the majority neither in Sena nor in the, in the House. So it is a complicated situation. So I think, yes, you. Thank you very much. My name is Al Shaikh. I'm the ambassador of Saudi Arabia to Czech Republic. Uh, I have a request and a question. My first request uh, was that uh, I would have loved to hear more about the current strategic threat to the Red Sea, to the Gulf, to the region, the interference, direct interference of the Iranians to the regions, and how to overcome that. And my question was that how much do you think that the Iranian would, would adhere to any protocol signed now or in 10 years to come? We have different belief, but would, I would like to hear your view. The first question may be much more addressed to Mr. Vondra since he was a, a Minister of Defense. Uh, before, and uh, he is very well aware of the um, uh, current situation in the region. But I would uh, love very much to hear your views, both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. I'm very honored that to have you here. Uh, to tell you the truth and to give you the very straight answer. As long as this regime is in the region, there will never be any peace. There will never be any tranquility because this regime's life is dependent of the crisis. He calls it, they call it the revolution, exporting of revolution. But you call it the exporting of trouble, destabilizing the region, the world, because they can't run the country. They are in total failure. And you see that the regional powers know they realize that this regime is the enemy number one. And we are very happy that Saudi Arabia is taking the lead. As the Iranian resistance, we are very happy. We are very happy. We have good relationship with uh, your colleagues, uh, fellow ambassadors in Paris, and I meet them also very much in Geneva, in New York. And we really wish you all the best because you are the one who, uh, who sustain the stability. And this coalition is unique in the history of the region. Thanks also to the wisdom of the people who found it. Because I know that this, this Yemen was once upon a time also a, a, a field of conflict, but unfortunately that conflict was at Nasser time, Ajabal Amr Nasser, and that was a conflict unnecessary. He triggered it against Saudi Arabia, which was beside, you know, the, the movement. But now, first time we are, I am seeing that strategically the regional powers also the Turkey, okay, Pakistan was little wishy-washy, but I think that Pakistan also can realize that uh, it belongs to the same side. So regime is isolated. That's why when you are isolated, you are more dangerous. We have a very good uh, saying in uh, Persian, which is in uh, Iranian poets, uh, Saadi, who made, uh, made a poesy, half Arabic, half Persian. Uh, and uh, he says it, that half Arabic is say, uh, al -kalb. 
That means when the, the cat is cornered and in a danger, the cat gets much aggressive against the, the dog. And that is the thing, you know, that is the thing what is happening. The regime is more dangerous because they are losing all their allies. They had Maliki, they had uh, Bashar Assad, they, they lost them. And also, uh, Russia cannot be 100% on board with them because Russia has also some other stakes in the region. So I answer to you that as long as this regime is in, in, in Iran, there will never be peace and stability. And if they make an atomic bomb or so, then the world will be really, really in danger. This is the first uh, question. The second thing was to you. Your Excellency, your thanks. Yes, 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 that is also the core of the problem, Excellency, because if they accept, adhere to the uh, protocol, that means that they have to open up, because when we, uh, we the resistance, Mujahideen Khalq, uh, my colleagues, uh, fellow uh, resistance, resistance people, they uh, found it, the first one, they were all in military bases, in Parchin. And because the regime is having them in the poster on uh, this uh, uh, SS uh, army uh, uh, barracks and battalions. So therefore, uh, it's very difficult. They have to accept it, otherwise the Congress won't, will not accept it. Nobody will accept it. And then uh, it won't be the, uh, the end of the sanctions because the regime wants to, uh, that the sanctions be... Uh, Lifters, and then they send money and ammunition to the Houthis, and then the, these Houthis are just Hezbollah. They made a Hezbollah of uh, uh, in, 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 in neighbor to the Saudi Arabia, and they call them now Hezbollah uh, Shaitan. They made the devil. They know a lot because they are really made a lot of uh, destruction in the region. So. Uh, this protocol is so difficult for regime to swallow because then they have to open up everywhere, everywhere for checking and control. Uh, just uh, that, that leads me to another question: uh, what you said on Tunisia and the whole context. There is a, a popular theory, popular explanation, growing here and uh, it's being spread particularly on social nets that in fact it is uh, West which is to be blamed for all that mess because it either interfered wrongly uh, or interfered on, on the wrong side. So in fact it interfered against secular dictators and it caused even, even more a dangerous situation. Uh, and um, uh, or another argument is that uh, West uh, even should have supported those secular dictators in order to maintain more stability in some particular countries. I, I don't agree much with that argument. I, I would say that uh, those uh, secular, so-called secular dictators, however we can describe them, were themselves in fact products of a Cold War world and they, uh, uh, they very much they were quite successful in maneuvering between East and West during the Cold War era. But uh, uh, after Cold War ended, they just lived uh, in, in a borrowed time. And their failure, their fall, was just a question of time. Might have happened maybe uh, more slowly if West didn't interfere in Iraq or didn't help to... Um, Join anti-Gaddafi forces in Libya, but in, in my feeling, it would have happened anyway. So, so my question uh, is: Would you agree that uh, West, in fact, missed the lesson taken from uh, uh, the development of Iranian Revolution uh, because it could have been taken as a predecessor? of uh, many things, many situations that have happened during uh, Arab Spring uh, events uh, 30 years later. And West should have been better prepared uh, taking into account what happened in 1979 in Iran because West should have, uh, should have known, should have been aware that once the secular dictator is over and at the same time there's a lack of institutional uh, network or framework, sooner or later, militant Islamists uh, could come and, and take over that. Would you agree with that? Yes, uh, I agree uh, with you, uh, uh, 
uh, to a certain extent that, uh, uh, you know, uh, during the Cold War, it was different. Uh, because I remember uh, I was a kid uh, in, the, in the revolution of 15. The three, uh, 1953, uh, the, the, the two, the party, the communist party, pro-Russia, pro-Moscow, they wanted to uh, make Iran another Iranistan, one of the republic. So they really disturbed, they frightened the West, they frightened the whole world, because they wanted to get the, the, the power from Mossadegh, who was a Muslim, who was a moderate, who was a civilized man, educated, and wanted to make a gradual democracy, you know? You cannot inject democracy. You know, uh, I don't blame the West uh, that, you know, they, uh, they didn't, you know, uh, help the democracy. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they put the money on the wrong horses. You know, they have given lots of uh, 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 room to the Shah, the king of Iran, uh, with the highest corruption and then a family was running and also they didn't let anybody to really breathe. And then, uh, and then you know, that, that led to that. But when it comes to the uprising and revolutions, I think that has to be uh, uh, done gradually. And the West, what the West can do is to try to help the moderate, civilized, uh, 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 democratic or national forces, but not to hurry. Because, you know, uh, over the night, you cannot bring democracy. Democracy has to grow, be, has to grow within the society. And then, you know, some, some kings, some rulers in the Middle East, I see that, they are very open, or they are trying to, to go towards a democracy process. I see many, many, uh, in the Arab countries, in the Gulf states, that they are really very aware, and, but they don't want to suddenly, to, to, to disturb the whole, uh, infra infrastructure of the uh, the society as as Khomeini did when he demolished the whole uh, institution and George Bush did demolished all the institutions of Iraq except the oil department the the others all the police and the army and everywhere was uh, was demolished so uh, I agree with you that you know uh, the West should be more vigilant, especially the United States of America, but everything is not in the hands of America. But I'm happy, I'm very happy that, for example, the move with, with Yemen, it is a good paradigm now, because now they are really helping East, this historic coalition. This is, this is very, this is going to change the face of the history of Middle East if this coalition as the Muslim says, inshallah, will really succeed. And that we curtail the regime, that we contain the, the devil, the, 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 the godfather of all this uh, terrorism and, and jihadism, and then uh, that will make. So they have to be more vigilant, they have to learn from the past. Uh, everybody has to learn from the past mistakes. So uh, still, uh, Europe is bleeding of those uh, blunders <laughs> that uh, they have been done during the Second World War and after. But but gradually, yes, I agree with you that uh, we should not we should not first put the blame first on one superpower or United States or Europe. But we have to also criticize them. Even I think uh, Saudi Arabia, which has a very good relationship with them, I like the Saudi Arabian government and the king. Face to face and the four eyes tells them what a mistake America they do. What they have done and what they have done. This is, this I call a good friendship. Uh, I would like to return back to this negotiation in Geneva. And uh, you said that even now the form of so called prepared agreement is very hard to swallow for Iran, uh, but even this kind of agreement so far, it's totally unacceptable for Israel. So can you somehow understand of the uh, position of Israel? Are you in, uh, in favor or do you agree with their position that it is a real threat to existence of Israel? Well, I think uh Gradually, the, the world is realizing that this threat is serious because this uh, ideology or this system or this regime has many legs. Terrorism, fundamentalism, 
disturbing the disturbing the, the, the infrastructures of the Middle East, Iraq and others, and also uh, to try, trying to acquire an atomic bomb. And it is their mantra every day, and they say we want to destroy Israel. They say that. All of them they say that. Some of them, they say them uh, openly, like Ahmadinejad, some of them they say it under their uh, above, you know. Uh, that's why Mr. Kissinger said the moderate mullah is a mullah uh, who is uh, run out of ammunition. Then they are moderate. So I think they have all this ideology of disturbing. It's not that really they love uh, Palestinian people. His Excellency knows very well. They are the num enemy number one of the Palestinians, this regime of Iran. They have managed to split the Palestinian movement to make the horrible organization like Jihad Islamic in it and then make them fighting each other. You know, the moderate forces like Mr. Abbas, they don't accept the regime. They gave the regime lots of uh, sometimes uh, uh, reproach and to say that, that you have reproach that you should not interfere in our thing. So it's not that they love they only want to disturb, and they have a destructive ideology. If they don't implement it, that doesn't mean that uh, they are nicer. Like they putting the hijab on the head of the ladies or curtailing the students uh, to listen music or something. You can't do, not do it because the people, they react to it. So I think there is a threat to everyone. There are threats to Israel, and there are threats to everyone, not also Israel. They say it's, yesterday, they, the, uh, the, 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 one of the top officers says that that we have these missiles, rockets in Yemen in the hand of Houthis, and we, we just ask them to shoot it against Saudi Arabia. I mean, for them, it's not a question of religion. Why should never, never, my dear friends, never think about it as a religious war? It's nothing to do with religion. These scholars of the Islam, they were the greatest in the, in the, in the Middle East. They were the, they were the, 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 the bridge maker between the Renaissance, between the uh, Enlightenment, between the philosophy of uh, Greece coming to Europe. The Europeans themselves, they say that they were the bridge from Baghdad, from the Arabic world. It has nothing to do with religion. It's something about an aggressive government who misused religion and who is threat, is threat not to Israel and only to everyone. No, to Saudi Arabia, not to Kuwait, not to everyone. So, and to the Iranian people. So I think the world has to unite against them. Regardless of which type of political conflict we have together, this is the enemy number one, in my opinion. And I am a diplomat, I should be very diplomatic, but here really I'm not. I think that the world has to waken up. This regime, if it acquired an atomic bomb and suddenly give it... A, like the size of a Coca-Cola to uh, somebody, Hezbollah, and blow the whole New York in a, in a, in a train station, then we realize this is, this is very, very serious. Oh, so many questions, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, Fabian Baxa from the Center of St uh, Security and Military Strategic Studies of University of Defense. Uh, thank you for interesting. Can you say this and please? Yeah. Uh, thank you for interesting presentation. And my question is focused on your on the democracy and Islam. You already mentioned some ideas, and. My perception is that democracy, we, are, we, are, we witnessed several attempts how to export ideologies to a, to a foreign environment, let's say, and from the past communism and today trying to export democracy to Afghanistan and other countries. And my perception is that the, those countries, this environment, cultural, political, is not prepared for that. They are, Perhaps they are not able to accept democratic principles just because uh, the exporters are from the West. Perhaps this is the time to return back to more antique, let's say, uh, style of democracy. And th this is the first part of my question. The second part, uh, if I remember correctly, there are four uh, schools of Islam. And what about what's the situation in those schools of Islam in Cairo, in Medina, uh, fo uh, focused on democratic, uh, let's say, style of ruling countries? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, regarding democracy, 
I agree that democracy cannot be exported, cannot be uh, injected, cannot be uh, forced upon nations. Every country, according to their history, their process of their culture and history, they must themselves gradually, some people uh, uh, much more slowly, some people much uh, a little rapidly, they have to do it themselves with their nation. They have to love their nation, their people, and then they should try to uh, find a solution to that, to give more room to decision making in the country. And uh, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, the freedom, idea of uh, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of uh, associations, they are embodied in the progressive Islam. They are embodied in the people who, who really were the scholars that really thought one day to the Europe uh, about these uh, values, you know, by poesy, by philosophy, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Ibn Sina, like uh, Rumi, like many, many others, many, many scholars in Arabic world, in, uh, in, in the world of uh, uh, Arabic scholars. So this is true. That, uh, but it's not uh, to say that, you know, uh, the culture of democracy, uh, some country, they have it forever and some people, they don't have it. But the only difference is that we have to let the people to themselves, the good governments, the good leaders, to slowly, slowly uh, incorporate people in their decision making. And every country has its own process. As I mentioned to you, Magna Carta came at 13th century in the United Kingdom in England at that time. But it took such a long process. You know, that is the, the first uh, democratic, uh, uh, except, uh, uh, except the Greece, uh, that is the, uh, the first democratic uh, pacta. But it took so many centuries, you know, and came to the French Revolution, but that has been hijacked also by killing each other, putting each other under guillotine and uh, those atrocities. Uh, so I agree with you. The, the second thing is the, the, about the schools of Islam. Well, I'm not an authority to talk about that, but uh, I could tell you that uh, there are in, in Sunni Islam four schools and with their own renowned leaders. And also in Shia Islam also there are many schools. And there are many schools in Shia Islam they don't accept this concept of Vilat al That means the absolute rule of a Khalifat, a Shia Khalifat. And the corruption rule that they have. So uh, there are different, like Christianity, I just refer you to your, to your Christianity. Uh, see what has happened in the Middle Age. You know, we have had Pope here, then we have had uh, Martin Luther, and we have had uh, Calvinists, neo-Calvinists, and and then you know they they build up the United States uh, uh, Constitution, but not fighting each other. Now I come back to what Muhammad said: it has to be a compromise between religious and non-religious people. You cannot just say we have to push away religion. You can't. Religion is deeply rooted in the people. We have to accept that. The same thing has happened, the process of democratization uh, in the Western world from Middle Age till today has taken a long process. Imagine that only in 1948 uh, France uh, has given the right to women to vote. And also in, in, in Switzerland just uh, much later. So uh, it, it takes it takes time. We have to respect the process of every country. But I assure you, I studied Islamic uh, law. I um, uh, studied the law in Tehran and also international law in Paris. I assure you that this is nothing to do in Islam, that Islam doesn't have a culture of humanity, doesn't have a culture of uh, freedom of speech, and has a culture of uh, freedom of thought. No. These people, Khomeini, Khomeinism, we call it. Let's call it Khomeinism. Let's don't call it Islam. I never call it Islam. Khomeinism, like Stalinism, Nazism, Fascism, has made his own, his own brand of religion. Maybe I will take a privilege to, uh, to, to, to uh, raise another question. And it, it, good idea, just listening to the last question, because I think it's uh, now everybody is uh, talking about, you know, there was a bad idea of exporting democracy, but those who uh, remember the debate and the discourse in the late 90s and uh, right before the invasion to Iraq, it was more complicated and uh, those 
simple formulation where you used rather for the domestic public audiences uh, to generate the support for s sending the armies abroad. But in, uh, in a discussion among uh, the experts in, in the United States, for example, I remember uh, on the eve of the invasion to Iraq, it was more structured, this argumentation. Uh, there is a classic uh, argument by Bernard Lewis that simply the core of the problem is that uh, modernization did not reach the greater Middle East. He blamed the Ottoman Turks for this. But given the fact that one of the preconditions of the modernity is a certain separation of state and church, the idea before, uh, behind the Iraqi invasion was that the liberation of Najaf will restructure the Shia world. Uh, there was this breaking the realm uh, paper, uh, Wirmser and the others. The argument was that if Shia is led by Qom in Iran, by Khomeini generation, uh, the separation of church and state is simply impossible. So if we, or if the West, contributes to the liberation of the second center of Shia, is Najaf in Iraq, Ayatollah Sistani, who was in favor of, you know, separating what belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar. Uh, that was, to be correct, a one of the expert driving force behind, uh, uh, behind the decision to, to go to Iraq. But the fact is that it has failed. And my question is, uh, you know, to you as an Iranian, why it has failed? Uh, is it impossible? Uh, it's proof that it's impossible to have a separation of church and state in Shia world? Well, as I told you, uh, there are many interpretations of uh, ideologies and religions and, and so on and so forth. There is no single religion or ideology which has not been interpreted in different uh, directions and different uh, ways. And Shia is not also uh, accepted, exceptional. So uh, um, there has been a movement within the Islam. The Islam of Shia was made as a political, I think, movement because uh, at that time Iran didn't want to go under the the Caliphate of the Baghdad, and later on to uh, Ottoman Empire, and then they wanted to keep uh, the Iranity of themselves and also the language. So that, therefore, they took this line of uh, Islam. There was a, a quarrel between two groups of uh, uh, who who will succeed Prophet Muhammad, and he had a cousin Ali, and the others were. The Khalifat who were established, who have been uh, accepted by the people, Omar, Osman, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr. And then, you know, and then there was a fight between the sons later, and the son of Ali was killed, Hussein. And then that has made a drama in, the, in, in those days in the Middle East. And the Iranian king of Safavid empire, they just wanted to take this branch, and in order to declare themselves the... Uh, the uh, follower disciples of that. So therefore, Islam got into two, two big branches from that century. Uh, but uh, again, as you said it very well, uh, there are different schools. You are right. Uh, Sistani and the people who are sitting in this uh, Najaf, which is the, the mausoleum of uh, Ali, uh, they are powerful. They are much more uh, open to the world. They are much more close to the realities of this century. They have good relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the Sunnis, with the uh, Arab states. But uh, their interpretation, I have read many times, and many before that also, Khoui and others, uh, was against that Khomeini established uh, fascism in the name of Shia Islam. So, but, but Khomeini is spending a lot of money, a lot of uh, students, uh, Taliban's, uh, Talabe they call them, uh, bring them to come this, this uh, holy city of Shias in Iran and uh, give them incentives, give them a lot of uh, things and uh, foment them and uh, hijack their, 
personalities and send them back. Some of them, they go back and they preach the same uh, uh, doctrine. But, uh, uh, and then the war of Iraq has weakened also these moderate Shias a lot because uh, the war of uh, invasion of Iraq has paved the way for uh, the Shia uh, of uh, Shias of uh, Khomeini's nature like Al-Badr, like those uh, uh, marionettes and luckies of the Iranian regime to, to invade Iraq. And they really invaded Iraq. And then Maliki was a sort of a minister for Khamenei. Everybody knows that. So uh, fortunately, he's gone. I hope this the new one, he's more wise. But he, has, he cannot not be not wise because uh, the Iraq of today is different between uh, after uh, the 2003. So there are d different interpretations, but there are also many, many Muslim movements and Shia uh, scholars who say that, you know, there has to be a participation, but none of them s goes against the religion. Uh, we cannot. You know, we have to incorporate. I think the process that some countries in the Middle East are taking is good. So, uh, yes, then this is the last question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tadi Englund. I'm a journalist from Norway. Um, I have two quite short questions. Yeah, go often. Uh, do you know anything about uh, the support for the exile opposition versus the local opposition in uh, the Iranian population? And the second question, some years ago, Crown Prince Ali Reza Pahlavi, or former Crown Prince Pahlavi, established a national council in Paris. Do you cooperate with uh, Mr. Pahlavi, and do you see any role, future role, for uh, the Shah family in Iran? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, <laughs> bravo, uh, um, uh, Well, if, when it comes to the uh, inside Iran, well. It's, everything is suffocated. There are only branches of mullahs who have their own groups. They are allowed to have gatherings to say, I'm a moderate, Rafsanjani, and others say, I'm hardliner. But this is a closed sort of a facade of a pluralism inside Iran. Whereas outside that, nobody, nobody can have a voice. Imagine in Iran, in Shia Islam, minority, uh, 80, 83% of Sunnis in, in Islamic world, and we have a big majority of Sunnis in Iran. They cannot open a mosque, Sunni mosque in Iran. They cannot have their, their, their imam in Tehran. They cannot have their uh, government, governor in Kurdistan uh, with, or also the, the Sunni region like Baluchistan. It has to be a Shia sent by Iranian government. So it is absolutely a suffocation inside Iran. But of course the Iranian resistance uh, is underground there. We are outside, but we are very much underground there. Uh, we have revealed the atomic venture of the regime. That is something shocked the world. We have people inside the, the, the apparatus of the regime, definitely, uh, at least Mujahideen. So this relation between outside and inside is by our satellites, uh, um, 24 hours, uh, we have a satellite uh, television that is jammed, and then we go to the, another company, and there is a fight, uh, a sky fight between us and, and the regime. But we have good connection with them. That's why the regime blame Mujahideen always. My, my friends, uh, Muslim friends in the resistance, that they are behind all these things. And they blame Mujahideen for having alliance with the, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, with the, the, the others, with others, with Israel, with all. So we will be allied to all the countries, nice countries like Saudi Arabia, who are fighting this devil in the, in the Middle East. We are very happy about that. When it comes to the, uh, the uh, son of the Shah, well, I am not sure that he has a chance. If the grand, great grandson of Ludwig the 40, 16 has a chance, there are still some people from that family. I think he has a chance. But, but we welcome him. We always send him messages. And we, in the beginning, he was preaching to make a kingdom again and himself become a king. So uh, we said we don't agree with that because that regime is gone. The king of Iran is gone. The corruption is gone. You cannot uh, again bring another 
king because the kings also uh, of look at the kings of Saudi Arabia there is a chain there is a chain historic chain look at the kingdom of Norway 900 years the chain of kingdom but the Shah's father was a was a gen, uh, not a general even was a colonel in the army he made a coup d'etat in uh, 1920s and he declared himself as a king so there is not not such a tradition in that family that you can bring the king like the line of kings in Saudi Arabia the line of kings in uh, in for example England or in 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 in, uh, in Denmark so he has no chance but we welcome him always we are, have nothing to do against him. We think everybody who fought, fights this regime is welcome. But recently he has changed his, uh, his doctrine. He says that he doesn't want to become the king. He wants the people to decide if we want to have a kingdom after the, uh, the toppling of the mullahs or a republic that we are for. So I think we are parallelly uh, fighting, but we have nothing against uh, the Reza Shah Pahlavi. No. Okay, I think we are running out of time already, so uh, if uh, there is no other uh, very important question, so let me first thank you that you came to Prague and spent uh, uh, the time with us and share your thoughts. Uh, I think it's very important, uh, in particular now uh, when Iran is again uh, the highlights of uh, the world news. Uh, it's my privilege also to thank uh, uh, to, uh, the two distinguished ambassadors, Ambassador of Saudi Arabia and Ambassador of Morocco, that you came uh, to visit us. You are always welcome, so it's a privilege to have you here. And thanks also to, uh, to once again to, to Jan Zahradil for uh, uh, co-sponsoring and helping us to uh, to prepare today's uh, late uh, afternoon and uh, last but not least uh, thanks to all of you came here raise your question because without you without uh, the audience uh, it would not make the sense at all so thank you very much and hope to see you again during some next opportunities. Thanks and good night.